Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you back. Good to be back. It's hard to believe it was uh, three weeks ago that I stood here and uh, brought a message out of Ephesians chapter 4. And we're still in Ephesians 4, so take your Bibles, open them up to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, for those of you that are our guests this morning, welcome. It's my pleasure to be here with you and to have you with us. I hope you receive a blessing from the service and that also after today you will come and be with us again. For you, I have an explanation. And that is that on Friday night, July the 5th, I went into the hospital. I got one of those nice little rides from Emergency Medical Services. And uh, in the emergency room, they were able to uh, retrieve my life. I am grateful to be here. God has given me another chance at life. The question is, if you could start over, think about this question. If you could start over, what would change? What would be different? What would you do? This message is about that. Not about me. Let me make it clear. The message is not about me, but the message is about you. The message is about Calvary Baptist Church. If today was the first day of the rest of your life, what would you do? What would be your goal? What would be your focus? Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, going through verse 16. But to each one of us, notice nobody left out, each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Now what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Everybody say mature. Everybody do that again. Mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things, now notice those words, in all things, grow up. Everybody say, grow up. Grow up. Turn to your neighbor say, grow up. Wives, you've been saying that to your husbands for years, I know. <laughs> we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, everybody say from him. from him. Notice, not me, not you, but from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. May God add his blessing.
to the reading of his word. Have you, you know, I don't know what TV shows you watch. None of my business. Truth is, probably all of us would be a little embarrassed if we knew, if other people knew what we watched on TV. I have a friend of mine who lives for game shows. Lord help us. I could do without those. But there was, a, there was a series on TV, and by the way, it will renew for its final season coming up sometime this fall, a series for the last four or five years known as Yellowstone. Now, I am a fan of the Western genre. I love everything, ranch, cowboy, you name it. And uh, I even like the actor who plays the main role. But this is a show that I would not recommend that believers watch. The language is absolutely foul. Every one of the Ten Commandments is broken in one episode. I mean, it is not, it is not an example of the kind of people that we are to be. There is a scene in one episode, however, that I found revealing. There's an orphaned homeless kid working on the largest ranch in Montana. And he's asked what he wants to be when he grows up. He points to John Dutton, the, the, you, the, the central character and owner of the ranch. And he says, him. I want to be him. Did any of you see that? Yeah, there's a few of you that'll admit to your sin, won't you? But anyways, just teasing. Him. I want to be him. Well, let me ask you this question. Who do you want to be? Who should we aspire to be? It says in verse 15, we will not we might, not we can, but we will in all things grow up into Him. What is necessary for us to be part of that united and growing church of Jesus Christ? I got five things I want to share. I want to share with you quickly. Because I hold a very limited air supply. Right now my heart is operating at a rate that uh, supplies about one third of the oxygen I need for my body. So this is taking everything I've got. Okay? So please, if you will, give God everything you've got at this moment. Number one. We need and we have a gracious master. Verse seven. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Nobody's left out. I want you to understand that God has given His grace to each and every one of you. Whatever you need, whatever I need to live for Christ, He has given us. Notice it says grace has been given. It's already done. It's already happened. By the way, the word grace refers to God's unlimited, unconditional, undeserved supply. Think of it as the bottomless well of God's love. God's love never runs out. And I'm not talking about the grace that saves you alone. But I'm talking about the, the equipping and enabling grace of God. 2 Peter 1, 2, and 3, he says this. Grace and peace be yours in abundance to the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need. Now, everybody look at that, verse 3, 2 Peter, verse 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. 
And then it says also again in verse 7, given as Christ apportioned it. Let me ask you this. Do you think Christ is holding out on you? I have a cousin who lives in Tennessee. Actually, I have 20-something cousins that live back in Tennessee. And she is to this day waiting on an answer from God. And she is not as close to God as she wants to be because she feels like God has not answered her question. Well, let me just simply say this to her and to you. God is not a debtor to any of us. The spirit of entitlement has no place in the church of Jesus Christ because God owes us nothing. Do I get an amen? amen. Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for your sins and mine and he rose from the dead that you and I might have eternal life and God does not owe me anything. But he gives it. And God is not stingy as Christ apportioned it. You know, what do we give our, you know, we, we try to give to our children and we try to be very careful not to give to our children more than they can handle. If your precious little girl came to you and said, Morgan, Mommy, can I have a car? <laughs> now, what kind of a car is she going to get? It'll probably be about like this. With no more than she can handle. And the same thing is true of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He knows what we can handle. He knows how much we can handle. And he gives us his grace as is needed. He is, an, uh, he is our enabler. He is central to everything we believe, say, and do. And without him, we can do nothing. And then verses 8 through 10. We get Paul's explanation. He actually quotes Psalm 68, 18. And he says... In verse 8, this is why it says in the NIV. In the King James, it says, this is why he says. Now, it's rather interesting why the different uh, translation there. Why does one say it and the other one say he? Here's why. Because the third person pronoun there is indefinite. You have to plug in. It, it depends on the context. And here he's talking about the scripture in Psalm 68, 18. Well, scripture is an it. Therefore, it says, but God is also the living word. So therefore, he says, the Apostle Paul never distinguishes between the written word of God and the living word of God. Christian, something else we need to realize from this text. And that is that God makes no distinction between what he writes and what he says. He will never contradict what he writes. And what he writes will never contradict what he says. It's a small thing. And most of us would not even notice it. But it's there. There are three things mentioned in verse 8. He ascended on high. And he led captives in his train. Or in the King James he led captivity captive. And this, this is foreign language to us. We, we can't relate to what he's talking about. But if we have lived in that time and we understood what he was talking about, this is what we would, this is what we would get. Paul is saying, look, Jesus Christ conquered life. Jesus Christ conquered death. Jesus Christ conquered conquered the enemy. He conquered sin. He conquered all the forces and powers in this world and in the world to come. And as the conquering hero, he has returned leading captives in his train. And amongst these captives are the rulers and the authorities and the powers that sought to enslave us. That's what he's talking about. 
Matter of fact, Colossians 2, 15, Paul makes this clear. He says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now we find ourselves in a political season. And in this last few weeks, we've seen lots of things happen. An attempted assassination, a president who is ill and infirm. And we see all these things going on. We see the parties going at each other. And what we also see is abuse of power, and corruption, and there's enough to go around. So many in our world seek power to exercise it over others and to hold on to it, and they will hold on to it no matter what. But I say to you by the word of God that they will lose that power because God has the ultimate power. Yeah. And that power does not have any human name except for the name Jesus. Remember what Jesus said to Pontius Pilate. He said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Church, we have a gracious, great master. And according to verse 8, he gave gifts to men. I think we should have a slide coming up here. Yep, there it is. We have in verses 9 and 10 a parenthetical explanation. That sounds like a big term, but it's really not. Basically, a parenthetical explanation is where you uh, say something to somebody and they go, huh? And then you tell them what you said. That's a parenthetical explanation. And we have that in verses 9 and 10. So he says, <clears throat> what does ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. So what does it mean? Well, the word here refers to the fact, as a matter of fact, in, in John's gospel, it says four times that Jesus came down from heaven. Did you know that? In John's gospel, it says four times that Jesus came down from heaven. Not only that, so that refers to his incarnation. Number two, it reveals, reveals it refers to his, his death and his burial. But there's a third part, and that's the grave itself. Not, not the physical grave, but death. The Bible word for this is Sheol, the abode of the dead, the, the nether regions, whatever you want to call them. Now there may be something you, there's something you may or may not know. Did you know that when Jesus was laid in the tomb, he descended. He descended into the lower parts of the earth for a purpose. So have you ever wondered, have you ever scratched your head and wondered, well, how can it be fair to the people that lived before Christ to die without hearing the gospel and then to face judgment? How can that be fair? Well, it's not. So God had a plan. And we find this written in a couple places in Peter's letters. First of all, in 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 20. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6, he says this. And for this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God 
in regard to the Spirit. Do you understand how far reaching God's grace is? He descended even to hell itself. And he took from the very bit of Satan the keys of hell and of death. And then verse 10, ascended. Not just resurrected, but ascended. In Ephesians 1, which we already looked at some weeks ago. But in Ephesians 1, it, it tells us about his ascension and his Power in his ascension. It says, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Then go back with me again, if you will, to Ephesians 4. Look at verse 10 again. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. Did you notice that heavens is plural? Have you ever wondered how many there are? Did you know according to Greek thought, according to the scripture, and according to the Apostle Paul, there are three heavens. There's first of all the atmospheric heaven, we call the sky. Then there's the astrological heaven, we call the planets and the stars. And it's somewhere betwixt those two that a Russian cosmonaut orbited the planet, went back to Mother Russia and said, there is no God or else I would have seen him. How small we are. How stupid we are. How brash and proud we are. There's a third heaven. It's a spiritual heaven. Interdimensional, outer dimensional, I cannot say because I don't think there are words in our human tongue that can describe it or explain it. But that's the heaven where God is. That is the place we see in the book of Revelation and Holy Scriptures. But it also says back there in verse 10 to fill the whole universe. The universe cannot contain Him. The Jews have a prayer. They pray every time they pray. As a matter of fact, Jesus prayed it several times when they had the Last Supper. And it goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Melech HaOlam in Hebrew means King of the Universe. Let me just simply say the universe is only part of his realm. Our master is gracious and great, therefore grow up. I said I was going to mention five. And I'm going to stop with number one. Because that's all I've got. I've got more here. We'll finish it next week. But let me ask you this. Who's your master? He's greater than you think. He's more loving than you know. He's got more for you to do than you could possibly think or imagine. I invite every person here, Christian, I invite every Christian here to please today, make today the beginning of a new day. The beginning of your new life. You were born again. If you've been born again, you started over. Start over here with Him as your master and let your focus be on Him. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then i got good news for you. You can start over today. You can have a clean slate. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have power to live a new life. 
You can have the hope of eternal life, the hope of heaven. You can have a true reason for living that goes beyond what you found so far. He will fill you. He will fill your life. The Bible says again, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will, not we might, not we can, but we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. And all God's people said. Amen. Brother Don, would you and Brother Keith please come?